Do you have a story to share with the world? Of course you do. We all have stories to share. An Anchor podcast allows you to share your interests in a way that connects to others all across the globe. If you have been considering starting your own podcast and don't know where to begin, Anchor makes it easy to record, edit, and publish with the click of a button. You can even add music. Whether it's crime dramas, self-improvement, paranormal adventures, or tips about parenting, you too can share your unique imprint on the world. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. You've got this. I believe in you. Welcome to the Existential Empath Podcast. My name is Tanya, and I am an intuitive empath. My intention is to share valuable tools and techniques that I have learned so you can tap into your own inner healer naturally and intuitively. I have some special guests with me today. I've actually had all three of these guests on my show before, and we are going to dive into conscious relationships, attracting healthy and meaningful connections in our lives. So today I have Ryan Gardner with me with Blue Moments Coaching. Ryan is a life coach and a near-death experiencer. Hi, Ryan. Hi, thank you for inviting me. And I have Stephanie Zumwalt. Stephanie is with the Higher Self Connection. She is a Beyond Quantum Healing practitioner and an author. Welcome, Steph. Hi, Tanya. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And I also have Steve Nowak with me with Trinity Healing Reiki. Steve is a spiritual coach as well as a near-death experiencer. Thank you, Steve, for coming on today. Hey, thank you for having me. A bunch more in there, too. Quantum healer, uh, zero-point practitioner. Yes, I know. And I think a lot of us are, are doing quantum healing. Many of us are. So I thought, you know, this was a really nice group of guests to come on because each one of us is uh, going through our own expansion and we are moving through the phases of uh, this awakening process. And we are all uh, doing the inner work. We are all doing the healing. And so, you know, one thing that I'm starting to recognize with my clients is that this is coming up. They're having a difficult time time with their relationships. They're, you know, they're doing a lot of that deep inner healing work. And then they're recognizing that their loved ones around them um, are not, uh, you know, in the same vibration or in the same frequency. So I wanted to tap into this today and really have a deep uh, dive discussion into all types of relationships. So not just intimate relationships, but also friendships, re relationships with our kids and how we can, you know, how we have been navigating through these, uh, you know, these energies and how we are, uh, you know, not only working through it ourselves, but also helping our loved ones work through this as well. So uh, who wants to start who, you know, out of the three of you, who wants to start and dive into this a little bit more and maybe share some ways that you have been working through uh, navigating, you know, these conscious relationships. Steph. Well, everybody raise their hand at Let's once. Let's go. <laughs> I know this is a tough topic because I know okay. for me it's it's difficult and, and it can be a little scary. And that's why I wanted to put this uh, information out there because many of us are going through this right now and it's tough to talk about. And I so I can go if you want. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead and share. Um, I will say becoming the observer of my own experience has helped observing myself like, okay, I'm watching a movie. I'm the character in this movie that I'm playing. Do I like how I'm interacting with the other characters? Um, also understanding that we're part of a uh, large movie, a large play, and that I can only edit my character, but I can't go into other people and edit them. I can make suggestions, but I have to sort of accept their part in this play. Um, besides uh, resetting and cleansing my nervous system uh, with the things like nature and the, the practice of exercises. Yeah. And I mean, that's for starters. I agree with you on that. And I think, you know, a really fine point to make there is to be the observer and to step back. And I think for me, learning to not engage as much in it, to be able to observe my thoughts and my behaviors and take a step back and say, you know, is this person reacting because of the way that I am uh, putting, you know, my energy out there? And, and so that, that's yeah, been very helpful understanding that it comes down to me changing my state of being to move into the next step. If there's resistance, no matter what somebody else is doing, 
It's about me resetting my nervous system to a state of love. Just vibrate as love. That's all I need to focus on, no matter what's going on around me. And that will return me to the correct alignment. Yeah. And so I think too, you know, at least in my experience, I have always been on a loop. Okay. So I would recognize that I was attracting the same types of partners into my life, the same types of friendships into my life. Um, so this, this is both male and female, you know, the types of intimate partners that I was attracting were usually, uh, people who liked to receive because I liked to give. It was something that, uh, I was an over giver. And so I was attracting people who received a lot and that weren't always comfortable with giving. So then I would get frustrated with myself because I wanted to receive love, you know, from them. And then I was witnessing that I was not, I was the one always giving the love. And so learning to take a step back and look at where the balance was within me, that giving and receiving and understanding that, okay, I need to learn to receive more. So it opened me up to being able to yeah, attract it allows more partners. You to, I think we lost you. Oh, really? It allows you to witness the patterns, basically, you know, the constructs that were programmed in your subconscious things from your parents, Disney, whatever else. Whatever other uh, identities of love that we grew up thinking, hey, that's love. Absolutely. Well, and it also, I also think that it has to do with like, for me, in my experience, with the degree that I loved myself, like to the degree that I loved myself uh, was was what I was like, what I was bringing into the relationship. And I, I, I just came out of a relationship. And the reason why Tanya and I were talking about doing this podcast is because so many women were going through the same things that I was going through at the same time, but we didn't know what men were going through. <laughs> it seemed like a bunch of us women were just kind of having this, a uh, uh, layer of an awakening. I mean, I, I've been on the journey of awakening for several years and this is the first relationship that I came into where I was, I felt that I was more conscious than I had ever been. And, and it was so different than the relationships I'd had in the past, because I was approaching it differently um, from a different vibration. I, my toxic traits were, um, I didn't, I didn't love myself. I thought that the only thing I was good for was sex or physical relationships. I thought that that's how, you know, I needed to operate. I thought I needed to be sexual and attract people with my body instead of my intellect or my value or my, you know, inside. And then at the end of the day, I would be left feeling like I was not valued because I, <laughs> I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't let people get deeper with me because I wasn't going deeper with myself. And when I realized that this was still playing out in the relationship that I just left, um, it, it was very uneven. It was very out of balance for me. And, and while I was moving through that relationship, the things that he would provoke within me, um, I would go inside and heal instead of blaming or being angry with him or, or, you know, manipulating him to do what I wanted him to do kind of behavior. That's a good point because yeah. I started to do the same thing. I realized whatever I created as lower energy, I could no longer place outside of me. I had mm -hmm. to start giving that to my source and that corrected the polarity. Eventually we vibrated out of alignment, but it right. corrected a lot of things. I could no longer create with that outside of me. Yes. And every time, every time I was doing that inner work, I was, changing the point of attraction that I had with him. I wasn't because subconsciously I was attracted to some of these, these not so great things, you know, needing to feel sexy, needing to feel, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, I wanted a deeper relationship. And every time I healed the things that I felt I was provoked with, I, I leveled up a little bit and then it came to a point, like you said, we, we vibrated out of alignment with each other where, where now I don't connect with him in the way that I did. And I, that different. I, you yeah. needed, you need new sustenance for your yeah. new soul, you know, yeah. pretty much. So Those not like identities I've, died off. Yeah. Not like all of a sudden I'm healed and now I'm going to have a, an amazing soulmate relationship. I know that the next relationship is going to provoke more things within me 
to grow from, but hopefully we grow together, mm-hmm. not apart. Hopefully that's mm-hmm. where I'm headed. So that's yeah, what so I've been Steve, going through. I like how you brought up how it's really important to observe yourself. And that was something I, that was a really harsh reality for me to come to con to, to, to accept. So I think the way I did it personally was I didn't necessarily isolate myself in a negative context, but I definitely went into hermit mode because I knew that my energy was going towards other people, whether it was family, whether it was work colleagues or whether it was intimate relationships I was giving all of my energy to everybody else and completely forgetting myself and so in order for me to get to where I am now I had to go internal and almost isolate myself from any external relationship this was a complete focus on me and myself. And I took everything that every relationship that, you know, had ever taught me. And I looked inside and said, okay, relationships, I believe are meant to bring our wounds to the surface. That's, that's ultimately what they do. So I looked back over all my relationships and what wounds were brought to the surface with each one of these and what work do I need to do to heal these wounds or at least acknowledge them maybe not even heal them, at least acknowledge them. And if I'm going to do that type of self work, I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to be in a relationship. I don't want a girlfriend. I don't want to whatever. I I, I don't want to be around any of that. And even when my family, you know, would, would, you know, possibly kind of question like, what's going on with you? You know, like, what are you doing? It's like, I'm discovering myself that that's exactly what I'm doing. And all this energy that I've put everywhere else outward is now going inward. And so if I disappear and I'm off the radar for a while, don't worry. It's a good thing for me. Yeah. And it's, you're building a conscious relationship with yourself, right? We're the most important, the most important relationship. And I always, I always, you know, suggest this to my to my clients. It is the most important relationship is to have with yourself. Even even if it looks selfish, it's very selflessly unselfish. I I agree. And and many people will think that that's selfish, that I'm going into hermit mode. I'm disconnecting from people and I, and not doing it out of um, spite or anger or anything like that. You're doing it because you are, you know, I know for me, I was doing it to master my own energy. I was like, you know, what is my energy? Because for so long I was carrying the energy of others. And so, you know, taking that time to, and I know Ryan, all of us, all three of us spend a lot of time in nature. I know nature has been a big healer, you know, for me. Well, like Ryan said, I also needed like five years to discern (laughs) myself and to really see myself accurately, to not uh, attract from the mother abandonment wounds. I didn't need somebody to do my laundry and make me lunch. I needed somebody that loved me. And you need to love yourself first, right? Right. You have to figure yourself out first. You need time to rewrite those neural pathways with the quantum field and start to draw in the love that you are. And then you're not willing to compromise it for, you know, something less. Right. I like that, Steve, to find out the love that you are, because that is what we are. That is where we came from. Creation is love. And so we embody love. That's what we are. And so many of us lose that. We lose touch with that. Well, I have to earn love. I have to be lovable. In order to be lovable, I need to meet these standards or I've got to perform this way or, you know, like you were saying. Yeah, you got to jump hoops. I've got to. It doesn't work like that. Give my body away or I've got to give my soul away or my money or what. No, that's, that's all silliness. That's, we are love. And it's, once you can understand that that's what you are and that that's where we come from, then you can your identity bleed it outwards right yeah and i think too when when we you know we we love ourselves we bring that worthiness and that value back like steph talked about you know when you are trying to find value in others rather than finding value within yourself 
it's constantly, you know, I, I remember in my ex marriage, it was always about the love tank, you know, the love bank, right? So I always felt like I was doing a lot of uh, withdrawals from my own love bank versus deposits, you know, in my own love bank. And so it, it got to a point where I was just, I was bankrupt in my love bank, you know, I mean, I didn't have enough love to give myself because I was depleting it. And so when we you know, turn that energy back around onto ourselves, it's almost like we naturally will exude love when we have an overabundance of love and value and worthiness for ourselves. But it, it, it takes some conscious understanding, like you said, Ryan, to even acknowledge that that's what we're doing, that we are constantly depleting our own, you know, sense of value and sense of worth because we are trying to seek it from others that we're looking well, for others to give us that those with those deposits. <laughs> yeah. And what the, the other thing I noticed I was doing in this relationship too, is that I I'm very good at, um, you know, letting other people be who they are, like just detached from needing them. It's my, I don't know if I No, you're good. Wrong. You're good. Okay. Um, not needing them to be different. So like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't get upset if people don't text me, you know, call me. like if you're out having so much fun that you don't even think about me, I am so excited for you. Like I genuinely am. But when you, what I ran into is that that kind of gets taken for granted or taken advantage of. And so then what I was doing is with my people pleasing tendencies, um, not speaking up because I was too afraid of the confrontation to say like, Hey, wait a minute though, that, you know, that's not on me. That was on you kind of behavior. It was a really weird boundary setting lesson for me is what it felt like. Yeah. And that's a good point. Learning to set boundaries, because I think too, many of us are, are sensitive and, and we want to people please. And at least that was my you know, kind of MO is I wanted to please my partner rather than pleasing myself. Cause I felt like you said, Ryan, it's selfish, you know, and we've got to change that mentality that it, that it is and selfish. We need to learn, you know, to love within, to go within and to find that, that love within ourselves. On, and the, to connect. Uh, on the subject of boundaries. Well, real quick, it, it's a lot easier to understand that it doesn't have to be harsh People that love you are going to understand when you tend to yourself, tend to your nervous system, because you're, you're like Ryan said, you're giving back from your heart. Your heart becomes this portal that just pours out love. And when you set boundaries, what I do anyway for myself, is I don't allow people in if they're not in a loving vibration, speaking to me lovingly, like they don't have to kiss my butt but they're not gonna come in with a lower vibration into my nervous system because I fought for the integrity and the peace. So once I set that tone, it separates the person from their entity. It separates the person from their lower self. If they wanna come communicate with me, you get to see who really loves you, who doesn't. And then you start to correct your inputs and outputs and you really draw that energy back in yourself. Yeah, boundaries. I love that. And I think boundaries are so critical in any relationship, including the relationship with yourself. So the way I see a lot of people when they think of boundaries, um, look at boundaries as a wall. And I don't see boundaries as a wall. I see it as a space. Boundaries are a space for me to love myself and you at the same time. It's a, it allows space for my safety and your safety. So to, to implement boundaries in a relationship is critical in order to keep your identity and maintain who you are. Without any boundaries, we become who our partner wants us to be. You know, husbands become what their wife wants them to be. Wives become what their husbands want them to be brothers, sisters, however you want to look at it. And we lose our own identity, which we lose our spark. And then we start putting all of our energy into that other person. And then what, like you were saying, Tonya, our cup becomes empty and you're just pouring from an empty cup. And we can't do that without draining ourselves 
completely. It's important to keep our cups full and boundaries allow that. They allow the cup to stay full. Because you have your own authentic identity. You know what I mean? You want to have those authentic quantum emissions, those vibrations, those feelings. And to stifle that to just fit into somebody else's is going to drain you. Absolutely. And that's what so many people do that. So many people do that where they just, they think that they need to act a certain way or fit in. And, and what we need to remember is that we are all authentic and this person was attracted to us or we're attracted to them for their authenticity and to be anything less is, is fake. It's phony. It's superficial. It's not going to work. You're going to end up resenting each other and being frustrated. And then that's when you're break down in communication. It just goes downhill from there. Yeah. And even like for the viewers, I also think it's important for, for people watching if they're thinking, okay, well, yeah, my boundaries are really good, but sometimes it's really important, I think, to inventory boundaries. And, and I needed to do that. How many of my boundaries are constructed from wounds or conditioning or because I was told this was a boundary I was supposed to have. And then how many of my boundaries of that type can I let go of to kind of free myself a little bit and establish my own boundaries rather than the boundaries that everybody else told me I needed to have? Yeah, I found they change a little each with each expansion. We'll expand more into our subconscious. We'll pause and process, place kind of new boundaries. But like you say, we're always growing. Mm -hmm. we are and and so important to be consistently looking at yourself mm -hmm. am i becoming a singular aspect of love and that's kind of your goal you come into the body as love you want to leave us love. yeah and i think too you know i know for at least my situation i grew up in a family where you know my mom had a little bit more masculine energy than my dad and so I was kind of trained to, as a boundary that to be a little bit more aggressive as a woman to be, you know, you don't need a man in your life. You can do it all. And, you know, so I kind of grew up witnessing that and, you know, our early years from the time we're born to roughly age seven, we're in those theta state years where we are learning how to be in society. We're learning how to function in our relationships. And so I, you know, for many of my life, I have filled that masculine role in my relationship. So I was attracting men who were more feminine, you know, more had more feminine, more nurturing, uh, you know, kind of energies. And so, but it would frustrate me because I wanted to sit in my receiving. It was hard for me to receive. And I know Steph and I have discussed this before that I wanted a man that was more alpha, you know, but I was attracting more betas, I guess, so to speak. And so for me, it was like, oh my gosh, Tanya, you know, how do you step back from your masculine energy and not, you know, be the one who feels the need to take the reins all the time to allow yourself to receive in a relationship? And for me, it was just this constant battle. But then I had that aha moment of, I need to fix this and heal this with inside of myself. I need to balance out my energies with inside myself. So then I can attract a more balanced partner in my life. And then once I started doing that, I noticed I was attracting more men who were standing in their masculine power. And I'm like, this is what I've been wanting. But I was, I felt more comfortable to sit back into my feminine energy and receive. Have you, have any of you experienced this before? I know you have Steph. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, my, my problem uh, or my awareness brought me to, um, you know, as a single mom and, and I'd been divorced. And, and so I kind of had to run the household. Like I, I had to be the man in the house for my kids. And, um, and I was raised by a, a dad who is very capable and will, you know, if anything breaks, we can fix it. If somebody can fix it, I can fix it. We'll figure it out. And so that is very, that type of energy in a relationship when I'm also a cancer and I'm very nurturing and very tender and very loving, but I felt like I had to have a wall up with that because I didn't, I, I, you know, I couldn't depend on anybody is what it felt like, but I'm pretty sure that it's because I wasn't allowing that. I wasn't allowing the men in my life to be masculine, you know, because I didn't think I could trust them because that was a wound, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. So I feel like I'm coming into my feminine energy more 
and um, and wondering what that looks like for men that go through the healing of their wounds. You know, a, a healed I would masculine. Say- I would say I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow women to love me. Whenever it got to the feeling of love, it scared the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. for me, like your parents are supposed to love you. You grow up in a house where your mom did all these unspeakable things. You wake up in the middle of the night. Nobody's around. You're walking in the streets at three years old in the dark. There are so many things that's about love that scared me. And uh, it took a while to correct that and allow that feeling coming from a person to enter my system. Interesting. Well, yeah. I had to to look at it differently. Yeah, we're taught what love means at a very young age, you know, and and we don't even think, I don't even think we're being, we we don't even realize that we're being taught Mm -hmm. that that's the love, right? Like you said, those first eight years of life, you are in those theta brain waves and it's like hypnotism. You know, we're an empty hard drive. And so you see mom and dad fighting and screaming in the kitchen or one's calling one names or the other one gives the silent treatment and they may do it to each other or they may also do it to you as a child. And then at night, it's like, good night, I love you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, (laughs) okay, well, I suppose this is what love is. And then I also, like, I see maybe dad leaves notes for mom saying, I love you. I hope you have a great day. And then come home, comes home from work, ignores her, tell her the dinner sucks. And you know, that he doesn't like her outfit and how you looks like you've gained a little bit of weight, but I love you. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> we're learning that. Okay. Well, I guess the way we express love is in all of these negative ways. Like, is that what love is? What, what is love? So I think, even the definition of love gets so convoluted and distorted that by the time we reach our late teens, our early twenties, our mid twenties, we're like, what is love? What the way I love love (laughs) is certainly not what they're showing in the movies or what the song is telling me is love. Right. Not not what I witnessed when I was young. That's for sure. Right. Right. But I didn't know it was so foreign by the time I had gotten to it. I had, dated so many women it was like okay what's wrong with me I got to the point where I was like what is wrong with me and I, that's when everything turned around see and I had a great example of love when I was growing up my parents I felt modeled it very well for me I didn't have those challenges I'm grateful that I didn't um but I screwed my my own vision up <laughs> when I became an adult I was so sheltered from like experiences outside of my own house and my own family that I kind of just went off the rails. And then, then I allowed the external to teach me a different view of love, I guess. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't stick with what my parents were showing me. I wanted to find that. I wanted that badly, but I didn't, I, I just figured that times had changed and that's not the way it goes anymore. And, and I'm no good. I'm not, I'm not worthy. I, you know, all of those things. For me, it was a lot of the unworthiness, like Mm -hmm. uh, being told you were supposed to be a girl when you were born, just all this pre-programmed stuff in my subconscious mind, because I'd never gone there and done the healing, wouldn't allow space for what was coming in, you know? It's like the waking consciousness being the operating system, like Brian said, subconscious being a hard drive, my hard drive was full of crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Well, you need that time. Yeah, you say that. I was the same. My parents thought I was going to be a boy. I was named Christopher. So all the clothes that I wore were green and yellow because, you know, and then you look at my sister and she's all pink and froofy, you know, so and she's super feminine, you know, but it's, uh, you know, and we can't blame our parents because they, they were taught based off of their generational patterns. It's just like Ryan said, bringing it to the conscious mind and be, being aware that these are the patterns that we yeah, are experiencing. That allowed me, that allowed me to witness what had happened uh, in their marriage and, and other things like that, that I was repeating. And I was like, holy crap. I got to the point where I was like, you know, no woman deserves what my mom did to me. What happened here in the past, they have enough of their own the process but I was able to step back and witness those patterns. Yeah, it was a really amazing time for me and it happened rather late in life. (laughs) Not too long ago, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, where I actually looked at my parents 
and I was like, they're human. Because I'd always seen them as these pillars of strength and these perfect archetypes of what a man's supposed mm-hmm. to be and what a woman's supposed to be, right? Like, right on. Old. And I'm like, they've both, disclaimer, I love you, mom and dad. I know you're going to watch this. But, <laughs> we all love our mom and dad. Yeah, Absolutely. Of course. But, but we all sometimes fail miserably in, in that in that expression and it's because we're all coming from our own walk our own story our own conditions generational curses which are passed down you know for from our ancestors wherever they are you know so we carry these with us and i truly believe that people are always doing the best that they can based on what they know where they're at and what they've learned you know, so I don't look at my parents and I have, you know, um, you know, bad feelings towards them. I don't look at them and think, oh, you know, they're horrible people. I'm like, no, they're, they've been on their journey and they've learned so much. And I mean, my parents are still together. They're still married. Um, you know, occasionally you'll hear my mom say, oh, I wonder what would have happened if I would have divorced. 30 years ago, like I really wanted to, you know, I don't know who knows what would have happened, but they stuck it out, you know, and, and yeah, so I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. And my folks, my folks, my folks were still married too. We just lost my mom a year ago this week. Um, and they were married for 54 years and, and, and they loved each other. They were in love with each other, but the problem that, that got set seated in my psyche I guess when I was growing up is that other other people's love came first I I I need to be on the back burner don't be selfish don't you know your needs can wait you need to let other people you know get whatever first and so that's really that was really deeply rooted in me and I and I seem I I had the same experience as you did Ryan where I I realized oh (laughs) <laughs> they just have wounds like they just have they just have filters too and perspectives and and experiences from their own child my parents childhood was awful mm-hmm. compared to what they gave me and right. the fact that they're they were doing as well as they did by the time my mom passed away is a shock to me but my dad I mean they just loved each other they, they just do um but me trying to get past that wound and she my my parents instilled it in my sister as well and so kind of pitted us against each other and so i always felt like i had to sit back and my needs don't aren't important they'll get tended to when they do kind of thing and so that was what i needed to really clear up within myself to where i felt comfortable saying hey this is what I need and this is what I want and this is what I desire and it's okay. I don't need to, I don't need to be put behind anyone else. No, I got to the point where I was incredibly thankful for everything. And I'm not saying there wasn't loving moments, of course, but I realized that I needed all that knowledge and all that discernment drifting from dense to light and all that stuff. You know, my father worked a lot. So it was like, nobody was really there. So I sought my attention through women, you know, and and it was the wrong place. It was supposed to be with, for me, for God, from God, you know what I mean? Uh, But you replay that sort of, okay, I never got this feeling. This, this is where I'm supposed to get love from. It's a woman. Now I'm going to try to get that feeling. And you're sort of running on this program. And it's scary. Heal it. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I don't know for all men, but I know there are some men that were thinking that obviously the ones that I was in a relationship with are thinking the same way that I was of like, you know, sex rate, you know, is, is the thing it's the, if you, you know, aren't having sex or connecting in that way, or if I'm not making her, you know, feel a certain way sexually, then I'm not, that's, I'm not valuable to her. She'll just go and find somebody else that can when in the end of the day it had nothing to do with any of that it has to do with how I you know how we're connecting on a deeper level like I need I want to be seen and valued for for the the vastness of me instead of and I don't need it but you know what I mean it's it's a really 
I'm I'm in a weird right. place right now. I mean, like it's more what Ryan, right? Yes. It's more what Ryan said about the uh, the parents only getting a certain of awareness, and, and we have to accept them for what they are, human. And it was true. It took me a long time to do that. But they were raised with wounds too. Their parents, their mm-hmm. parents, their parents, and we're the ones that break them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like you were saying, also how you were grateful for some of them. I've I've actually reached that point into my life where I am extremely grateful for all of my parents' wounds. Mm-hmm. The, they've they've taught me and opened my eyes and given me an awareness of my mission now. They did their best. I'm aware of this. Now it's my turn. And what can I do to break certain generational curses? Going back to intimacy and sexuality and things like that, sexual energy is so powerful. It is, it is, it's, it's enormous, right? Like, and it's, it's so much more than just sex, Mm -hmm. Right. People think sexual intimacy or sexual energy and immediately they're like, well, OK, I'm in bed naked with somebody. No, sexuality. <laughs> or they say is, it's love, right? <laughs> or they say it's yeah. love. And it's so much deeper than that. It's it's an intimate connection. And, and sexuality is actually healing energy. It's all in our sacred chakra there, a, which is a sacred energetic creativity connection. and creative. Yes. It's creative just life a force. Beautiful energy. And it's. That's where I think, you know, some of the disconnect has has happened with men over the years is their definition of sexuality and what it means to them and men not embracing their divine feminine, Mm -hmm. right? Their creativity, their accepting, forgiving, Mm -hmm. the heart-centered, intuitive, you know, nurturing healing that's all around sexual healing yes, yes and it's I all think, energetic and, yeah. I, and i think that and i think that i heard something recently about how um this like i said there were a bunch of women that were going through these breakups and and a lot of it was like we were stepping into our divine feminine, like really feeling that surge rising up. And I'm not talking about societal things going on. I'm talking about the energy of creation. And, and we were really embodying that, but the relationships that we were in were not in their divine masculine and they didn't have their healed divine feminine energy. Like you're talking about Ryan. And, and, and that is what, is curious to me like what is that you know for men what are men healing is that the mother wounds is that what is that that men are working on to become more conscious in that area yeah well i mean i would start by the traits you know of a a healthy masculine who is developed in all the archetypes the king the magician the lover you know, the warrior, you know, and what does that look like? I mean, masculine energy is action. It's risk, it's discipline, it's boundaries, you know, it's structure, it's self-control, it's outward, where, you know, the feminine energy is more intuitive. Like, you know, I was saying before, it's more receptive. And men, a lot of men are underdeveloped in their masculinity. And it's really not their fault. It comes back to inner childhood wounds. And so I would encourage men to research and look around at what is a masculine? What is masculine energy? And how do I embody this masculine energy? And am I underdeveloped in some areas? Am I overdeveloped? Have I become a tyrant? Have I become a trickster? You know, what have I become? You know, um, I also think at the same time that, yeah, women, feminine energy has been suppressed. There's no doubt about that. And that's because of, I believe, the underdeveloped masculine. And it starts with the patriarchy that goes all the way back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I've also noticed that the feminine is now adopting the unhealthy masculine energies trying to fight back. Yes. 
right? Yes. And yes. That's, yes. Not, yes. that's not going to work. No. Nope. It's not going to work. <laughs> And it's not fun. And, it doesn't. And we don't feel, want to. It doesn't feel natural. You right? No, <laughs> no, right. no. And we, we don't want to possess, do that. We, we all want. possess both, right? Right. Like masculine and feminine is is not gender. It's no, energy. Right. Mm-hmm. And so right. we all possess both. And it's bringing them together in a union and letting them work in harmony. And it's not easy. It's no, not it's, easy. It no, it's like really a work. divine dance. You know, it's like, you know, just when you are with, when you have your masculine and feminine energy balanced and you meet someone who does, whoo, talk about sexual energy. Talk about the creation. cosmos are dancing. Oh They're my running. gosh. It's, hey, it, I'm it, excited for that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Bring it on. I'm so excited for that. Seriously, because it's true. You, you, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in that energy. I don't, I want to be balanced and I want somebody that is balanced also. And, and men, and I believe that Ryan, what you just said is so important for men to understand to the deepest abilities. (laughs) They, they need this information to be out there. I, I, I just, I don't know if there is a space that is growing with that. I hope it is. Um, obviously I don't go searching for those topics, but, um, they all, they also need the tools too. Yes. You know, to, do, to be able to do the work within themselves and move consciousness mm-hmm. and, you know, understand those traits that need to be corrected. Yeah. yeah and I think society is so kind find, of really being... find harmony, you know, yeah, all and... of creation. Right. Absolutely. And I feel that society has kind of made, you know, men moving more into their divine feminine, like a weakness, you know, and it's yeah. not, I mean, it's actually very attractive when a man is balanced in their masculine and feminine energies. Do you and, know how bad it messed me up to stuff all those feelings down that I was having? Oh, kitten was cute. That cloud is pretty, but you couldn't say it around your friend. You couldn't, mm-hmm. you know, so I just stuffed my natural feelings down. Wow. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I was the opposite. It was just, I, it was almost like I had reverse polarities and, you know, but I, but I, like we talked about earlier, we've got to look at our parents in their childlike form. I mean, my parents had me in their early twenties. I mean, come on. If I had kids in my early twenties, I was clubbing. I was in Daytona beach. I was living my best life, you know, back then. I mean, I can't imagine raising a child, two children, you know, me and my sister, in my 20s, you know, so you've got to think, you know, based off of our parents and where they were at that time, they were, they were children raising me, you know, and so, of course, there was just this total uh, imbalance of energies that I carried on through my adult life, and my gosh, it's like, finally, you know, I'm starting to learn that I've got to, when I had my, when I had my older daughter, I was only 22, so I definitely was not prepared. I abandoned myself. I sabotaged it. In my mind, I couldn't even form an image of being a father. And I showed up, but not as much as I could have if I showed up for myself. See, I had my daughter when I was 20, and and I um, <laughs> I created some wounds with her. I Unfortunately, and, and we've done a lot of work together to um, heal. Uh, I've... I've I've been able to apologize and really make, make amends for the things that she went through because I was still running around trying to figure out how I could be loved unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And it Same created here. a lot of drama for her, unfortunately, but she's, she's a warrior because of it and, and she's learning. So, so yeah, I didn't have my first child until I was in my late twenties, 28, 29. And um, I think it's, it's important f- to celebrate our evolvement and our evolution that we have made as individuals because I am a much different parent today than I was 15 years ago, Yeah, me too. right? And Amen. it's really important to recognize that and see how far we've come and let our children identify that also because my daughter my oldest she's 18 now would say to me dad you're a completely different dad than you were when I was eight and I'm like awesome let's celebrate that let that's fantastic that's the work that daddy's put into himself 
to be and that. That's you stepping into those archetypes and those traits and being able to show up, you know. Ah, uh, and then really we, and then hopefully it just continues, you know, because certainly right. I conditioned her in a certain way, and now I'm conditioning my son, who's much younger than her, you know, in a different way. So they're both having two different. They've both got a different dad that raised them, you know, a completely yeah. different dad on both ends. But, you know, they can continue that evolving and that healing. And collectively, the whole freaking planet needs to heal when it comes to this, you know. Yes. But that's got to start with each person. Each person has to do their part. Yeah, individual yeah. responsibility. I mean, uh, it's a planetary cleanse, whether they like it or not. So as much as they are right. this, that's the harder it's going mm -hmm. uh, to be to really maintain uh, and sustain those those lower frequencies. That's why we see what we're seeing on the planet now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that conditioning can change. I mean, whether you're 20, you're 40, you're 60, you can heal those wounds. You can, like you said, Ryan, you know, you were a different dad when she was eight versus when she's 18. You can change. You can shift that. And you can, you know, apologize. You can heal. You can show through action, through that divine masculine, that I am changing. I am expanding myself. I am growing. You and your daughter is witnessing frequency. that. Yeah, she's, he's holding the frequency, and then we have to do the soul work to arrive at that space to hold right. it. And right. well, also here we mention are. We're still humans, right? <laughs> Nobody's claiming to be perfect. We all know perfection doesn't exist in this 3D world. So, mm -hmm. of course, I still make mistakes, and I listen. I'm not closed off when my son or my daughter says, dad, I, I, I didn't really like that, or that didn't feel right to me. I don't, it's not a, don't talk to me that way. I don't want to hear it. It's more of a open. It's wide open. My kids can come to me and say, Hey, dad, this is how I felt. Awesome. I'm so glad that you're able to express that and you feel safe. You can be vulnerable with me and know that I'm not going to lash out at you or, yeah. you know, tell you that and you're understanding <laughs> and understanding and teaching our kids that everyone has a perspective and no matter yes. what your perspective is your truth, you know, Absolutely. it's your reality. And so my kids, my daughter, I have three kids. I, my daughter's almost, uh, she's 27. I have a 22 year old and then a 13 year old. So you're talking about kids having different experiences. They're different mothers. Each one of my kids has a different mother. <laughs> <laughs> and had a different childhood and um uh, and but my daughter's perspective of things when she was growing up well I didn't want to admit that to be true it was her perspective and it was her reality and and I have I, I need to be open to that and understanding what that felt like for her so that I can have a conversation about where I maybe would have chosen differently because everybody is, like you said, doing the best that they can at the time with the knowledge that they have and the, the awareness that they have. But as time goes on, obviously that shifts and that changes. And I can say, listen, yeah, if it were different, I wish I could do it again, but I can't. Uh, if I could, this is what I would have done, you know, and have that conversation because that will help her expand and grow and, and transform too. You know, I didn't realize like with my younger daughter, or actually my older daughter, rather, that I had to give her a safe space to grow in, that she had to have her own space to express herself. And I was able to correct that. And like Ryan mentioned, be a much different dad with the younger one, who's 11 now, and actually give her a safe space of expression for whatever feeling she has, you know, and it's made a big difference. Yeah. And that's what conscious relationships are all about is recognizing that and, yeah. you know, seeing, seeing that within yourself and now being able to, you know, show that to your children, you know, yeah. and that. And not only that, like, as they're giving you stuff, if there's things rising up in you, you don't give that to your child. You keep that and you discern that with your spirit. And that's that internal processor. But it's just holding that space and allowing them to be themselves. Whether it disturbs you or not, if it disturbs us, then we have something to heal or some sort of wound that we're highlighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so often we think our children belong to us. Yeah. And they don't. They come through us 
but they don't belong to us. Yeah. Right. No, we're, we're here to keep them uh, uh, as love for as long as we can. And that's it. We're basically entrusted with them, I think. Right. Yeah. It's, there's an awesome poem on children by Khalil Gibran. And it's our children are the arrows. We're the bow and the archer is life. And as bows, we need to be bendable and flexible. So life, the archer can pull us back and release our arrows wherever they're intended wherever life intends them to go that's beautiful I love that I love that that's awesome and you know I, I do I think you know our our kids are little reflections of us right so you know whatever we have taught them too, right <laughs> <laughs> like, little ah, oh, I thought I fixed that part no what's <laughs> Yeah. But it's like, I keep, t- I just keep telling my kids, I'm like, you chose me. So I don't, you got to yeah, figure that out. You chose me at a soul level <laughs> to experience this. This is a contract you made long before you got here. I just got to be me and you figure it out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I think, you know, I think it's so important to, to have these discussions because, and I think too, communication, I didn't have that in my childhood. My mom, she was a middle child and she, you know, she grew up in the era where you don't speak unless you're spoken to, right? So her throat chakra was just shut off. And so when she, when I was a kid, her throat chakra was on full 200% hardcore. So I could never get a word in, you know, edgewise. And so then when I became an adult, I, my throat chakra was wide open and I couldn't shut up, you know? So it's like, okay, I'm seeing this pattern within myself. And now I need to learn to heal these aspects that were carried on from her past on to into my past. And so I think too, you know, we are just learning to communicate and communication is speaking and listening, you know, and I think that's really important as a parent. Sometimes we think we just have to tell our kids what to do without sitting back and actually listening to what our kids are going through and how they're experiencing yeah. life. Right. I mean, honestly, I can with- say my children are one of my greatest teachers. <laughs> Absolutely. Their consciousness is so expanded, even beyond ours being born. Uh, it's incredible how much data they're processing. They just need the tools. Yeah. And, yeah. The love. <laughs> and they look but, to us for those tools, right? <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that brings me to something else is like, you can't like respecting each other's journey. Like you have to allow them to, to go through what they're going to go through and not try to interfere too much. You know, I feel like sometimes, especially when we go through our own healing journey, we, we, we think we got it figured out and we want everybody to have it figured out. And so then you just shove it all down their throat, whether they're ready for it or not. And then that just pushes them away. It's like, there's a balance there too. Yeah. You have to let them experience their contrast. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to form that contrast, learn from that's hard to watch. It's really hard to watch sometimes, but you got to respect it. And and be there and, and, and listen without judgment and, and just let be a safe space to fall, you know, Mm -hmm. respect it, be a safe place. And I always like to remind myself that my children are protected. Mm -hmm. My children are protected outside of me, Mm -hmm. right? They've got their own guides watching over them. They've got their own higher self and it is developing and is it's, it's my, position as their father to create space for them to develop that give them guidance but not try to make them like me but even to strive to be more like them they're like plants i found it's like you can drop a little seed you can give it a little water but you can't over water it you know Mm -hmm. it's like i'm looking for these little experiences where i can drop a seed for when they are in a certain place in their adulthood and they can draw from that later Mm -hmm. not giving him too much yeah my middle son is going through a period in his life where he's he's searching and uh, masculinity has come up um and like i say he's raised by a single mom and he does have my dad as a role model but so he's he's kind of trying to figure out what that looks like for him and and he searches these patterns once in a while that i've seen that are shocking to me because that's not how (laughs) 
I taught him. Um, but I just say in the back and like, instead of getting triggered or upset or whatever, having, you know, I'm just trying to let him go the way that he needs to go and remind myself of the, the parts of him that I want to him to not forget, I guess, like reminding myself, oh, he's a compassionate kid. He's got a good head on his shoulders. You know, he is very balanced and I know he's finding his way kind of thing and try to just let it unfold. It's, it's there's so many things in the world that want to decide their identity, our identity for us. And I, I think that brings us back to why it's important to let them know as often as we can that your identity is love as an energy. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve, you keep bringing that word up. And I, yeah. I love that you do that. That is so awesome. Love. You, you don't hear a lot of men even use that word these days. Yeah. You know? So to hear you say that and to hear other people say that and to try and exemplify that for other people, everything positive is sourced from love. Yeah. Yeah. And if you what if would you, love to. It's, it's so true. What would love do? Mm -hmm. Right. And during, and if, during my NDE, I, I was shown that I, we we spend this love energy to process reality through bands of information, and we spend here, spend there, spend there, but we are pure love. I was in the middle of like a medicine wheel or something. That's awesome. And it, you know, if you're struggling with life, speak to a four-year-old, right? So yes. they're, yeah, they, go, go they always bring it back to while. love, right? They bring it back to compassion, unconditional love. They're so close to source, our children, and they're coming in at higher and higher frequencies, you know, and these kids have so much knowledge and so much information. I mean, I, I can sit down with a seven-year-old and have a much more meaningful conversation sometimes than I do with a 50-year-old, you know? Beautiful, right? Yes. And you're like, God, they keep it so simple. It just, it just breaks it back down to love. <laughs> I love kids, man. <laughs> I, do too. My, I have two grandkids now and uh, my granddaughter is six and uh, my grandson's four and they, they both came over to stay the night recently. And there was a bug out on the porch and um, the little, my little grandson, Dustin stepped on it and killed it. And Macy, my granddaughter goes, why'd you do that? He's just trying to live his life. <laughs> and it was the cutest thing. So innocent. They're so still connected to uh, that, that empathy mm -hmm. and that because they, they are such a big part of creation. They haven't formed a lot of separation yet, you know? Yep. It's that beautiful. was the little warrior archetype coming out of the little boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like we're all You're Benjamin right. Button, right? We're all just right. trying to go through our life getting back to our childhood. Oh, back state. there. <laughs> yes, totally. I think well, another big part of that, too, is like the, the young men coming up, they really don't have ways to prove themselves anymore. So sometimes they fall into the patterns where they're trying to prove their masculinity through ways that they really shouldn't be, or they really can't be. Oh, you know? that's so powerful. That's true. Mm -hmm. There's no more warrior tribes, uh, hunting, uh, gatherers, things like that. I mean, there are, but they're far and few. Mm -hmm. The initiation, wow. the initiation kind of process has been stolen. Um, you know, and that's because of a lack of developed masculines today. Yeah. So what are some things that, you know, Steve and Ryan, that you feel that you can share with men today that will help them, you know, balance out these energies? What are some things that you feel that would be valuable, you know, advice? I would say tap into your feelings and, and be vulnerability. And also not worrying, trying to, trying not to worry about what other people think so much, right? And for me, the easiest way to do that was to disconnect. It goes back to my original story of me, you know, finding this path that I'm on. It's disconnecting a little bit from society and what society is, has taught me my whole life, you know? And really, I find in meditation, I can find a lot of those emotions that just want to come to the surface that have been so suppressed for so many years. So I think meditation is extremely important. I also think gratitude, 
gratitude is a very powerful emotion. Um, it brings a lot of other emotions to the surface. And, you know, like I have my clients um, write three things that they're grateful for every day. And for the first three or four weeks, it's like my truck, my boots, you know, my dog, my house. And I'm like, okay, every single day we've got three. And then eventually it's like the flowers, mm -hmm. the sun, the warmth, gratitude. I'm grateful for gratitude. And they start tapping more into that feminine energy. So I don't know. I, mean, that's, I love that. that those are all. Keep it brief. No, that's that's well, and disconnect, I think, too, from, from it. I mean, not just the people around you, but also the behaviors that you're just on autopilot with. You know, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing with your time? And how is it serving you? And why are you doing it? And just really being, being aware of, of <laughs> the present moment, you know, being mm -hmm. in the present moment and really understanding why you do what you do. My, my journey has always been about what, what motivation do I have for this behavior or this step that I'm taking, you know, what is the underlying motivation? What am I trying to get out of this? Is it trying to feed something in me or am I trying to grow or expand or help or, you know, just really explore inside what's going on for me as a feminine. And not disconnecting in a fight, flight, or freeze response, but disconnecting in a healing response, right? You're like, I'm not going to disconnect from my relationship because I'm going to uh, ignore, right, all of the triggers that are happening or the things that are coming up, but to actually disconnect so you can work on yourself and you can heal. Yeah, There's a big I, difference there. <laughs> I think meditation is, is a very powerful way to do that. Meditation, mm -hmm. journaling, coloring. There's a lot of these things that, that men could start doing. And, you know, for any women out there that are watching this, that have men in their lives that are concerned about this kind of stuff, buy them a coloring book. Mm -hmm. I think that's they absolutely, because that, you know what that does, it, it connects both the right and left hemispheres of the brain, which is our masculine and feminine energies. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point. Uh, I'll come in and answer your question on the masculine. What really helped me was reconnecting with my inner child, was doing all these things that I did, as, not only as a child, but connecting to it as a mirror of myself. I have this original image, it's a child, it's inside me, it's made out of love. Then I began inputting commands with my mind, inner child become present, thank you. Inner child, please show me what love feels like. Please show me what joy feels like. Show me what excitement feels like. And I will get these flashes all the way through my nervous system and eventually, like Ryan was talking about with the gratitude, you become that. You become these feelings you're introducing into your system. And you're in control of that. But doing the thing, like adventure through the woods, go explore here, go do this, that I did, did as a child without worrying about what others thought, brought me such pure joy and happiness that I could spontaneously combust at times just to be alive and be a part of this place. You know, so there's a lot of inner child work, but putting it into motion. It's not enough to say, I'm going to work with my inner child, do this, at least for me, I want to input commands into my computational system because that's what we are, a computational being, basically. Yeah, I and I tell think- myself how to enlighten my own system. Absolutely. So good. I yeah, also I think, think that's great. Yeah. Disconnecting from the things I was like dis saying, disconnect from this, and you nailed it right on the head. Disconnect from this, reconnect with your child. Your yeah. Inner. Yeah. It's like correcting those inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and reestablishing what intimacy means to us into me, I see, right? So it's getting within that intimate relationship with our inner child, right? Going back and healing that aspect yeah. within ourselves, because like we talked about before, many of us have a uh, misconception or a manipulated kind of version of what intimacy is and learning how to, uh, go back and, and find those intimate moments with ourselves, with nature and really connecting, you know, on a much yeah, deeper, like, more meaningful level. I can level. laugh again. I can laugh again and do all these things that I was numb to before. 
Yeah. You know, and I, I reconnected my neural pathways uh, to the quantum field. And I understood that was my dispensa dispensation of love, that I didn't need to, to have all these links out here, like Ryan was talking about, and out here and out here to get it back. I now became a more singular self, and I can give more back to the people I do love. Because all you need is within. We have all we need. And once we connect to that, it, it changes everything. It changes mm -hmm. everything. It does. Well, this was an amazing conversation today, and I'm sure we could even go longer. There's so many, you know, concepts around this topic with conscious relationships, but I feel like we touched on, we touched on intimacy. We touched on relationships. We touched on children. I really do feel like we tried to cover a broad variety of topics. And I hope for all of you listening that this was helpful. And so I want to just have each of you go around and share what it is that you do and how people can contact you if people resonate and they feel that they want to reach out to you and they want to learn more. So Steph, you know, how, how can people reach out to you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Um, you can also, I have a website, stephaniezumwalt.com. I'm writing a book, The Higher Self Connection, that should be out this this fall sometime, hopefully. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not really working with clients right now, but you can follow my podcast to get more information on the things that I'm going through and what I'm learning. And hopefully it helps some of you. Thanks, Steph. How about you, Steve? Uh, you can find me at trinityhealingreiki.com. Uh, I work with Zero Point Energy. That's just kind of like the old name of the site when I set it up. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Trinity Healing. Um, my phone number should be there. I also want to add in whatever you're doing, do it consistently. Don't give up on it. Don't do it once or twice. Think it's going to work because you're releasing patterns you've done consistently for years. So you want to now set a pattern consistently to replace that. But uh, yeah, Trinity Healing Reiki. Thanks, Steve. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, so um, I'm so I do life coaching. You can find me on Facebook, just at Ryan Gardner, or Blue Moments Coaching. Um, I primarily focus on um, life purpose, spirituality, life balance, um, and you could or you can reach me at Blue Moments Coaching at Gmail. Great. Well, I appreciate all of you for spending time with me today. Uh, I know this was uh, the stars had to align for all four of us to come together today. And I do appreciate each and every one of you for uh, sharing your, your wisdom and your knowledge and your experiences, because I know this this was a vulnerable podcast today, for sure. I know it was for me. It's not always comfortable to be able to share some of the experiences that we've gone through. And I appreciate each and every one of you. And for all of you listeners and viewers out there, uh, you know, again, I hope that there you can get a little uh, bit of information or some tidbits of things that you can utilize in your daily life that can help you improve your relationships in the way that you connect and interact in this world. So thank you all so very much. You deserve to navigate your life as an empath in alignment with health, happiness, and abundance. To learn more about the services that I provide, including Beyond Quantum Healing Hypnosis, EFT Tapping, and the Emotion Code, visit my website at www.thesoulcafe.org.